Brian Michael Bendis is a five-time winner of the prestigious Eisner Award, so it's odd to see such an accomplished writer crank out this careless cacophony of prose. And that isn't to say that experienced writers must be perfect at all times, because they aren't. But this is essentially our introduction to the character of Riri Williams, the girl who would steal Tony Stark's Iron Man identity, from design all the way down to his comic, as her first outing was under the Iron Man title, to trick the poor normie unaware of Marvel's descent into political lunacy into picking up Williams' debut issue. Because when a company shows off a new character, nothing says bold confidence like deliberately tricking your buyers into purchasing one character when they meant to buy another. Technically, this is the fourth page of the comic, but the first two pages are fan fiction levels of self-indulgence since it basically involves a child psychologist gushing about how super special awesome Riri Williams is, and chastising her parents for not realizing how super special awesome Riri Williams is. And then of course the parents feeling really bad for not realizing how super special awesome Riri Williams is. Whatever your opinion about Bendis, he definitely knows he's writing for a pathetically fragile audience and desperate need of coddling and cheap validation. However, all we get of Riri Williams in these initial pages is the back of her head and a splash page of an Iron Man style suit which doesn't tell us much except Riri loves this world, allegedly. But let's get down to business, shall we? This page is the very first time we're properly introduced to the status quo version of Riri Williams, aka the version of her we follow throughout the comics. And for our very first scene with our brand new hero, we get this. Hi, okay, so that's the process. Tony Stark, Tony Stark, Tony Stark, Tony Stark, the Invincible Avenger Iron Man is no more. I was just getting to know him, and now he's gone. I was just getting... Wow, another I was just getting, immediately over the last one. Five Eisners, huh? Okay. I was just getting over the fact that he knew my name, and now he's gone. And I have armor. Yes, we know he's gone. You said that already. It's like he was meant to be or something. I don't even think that way. But this is too big and, and too connected. It has to mean something. I'm supposed to be Iron Man now? Me? That is insane. But, but honestly, I wish Tony Stark was here. He wasn't done yet and... In comics, it's good practice to end a page with a small cliffhanger or exciting event that will prompt the reader into turning the page. Here, Reby Williams ends her quirky tirade by ending with a sentence cutoff, prompting us to turn the page in order to complete the sentence. And to be fair, this isn't a terrible way of getting the reader to turn the page. Just like a horror movie, having a jump scare or two is fine. But again, this is the first real page of Reby Williams and her initial story. In other words, the quality of intrigue should ideally be higher than than a simple, let's finish the sentence. And what makes matters worse is we have everything required for a much higher quality page turn already present within the scene. All we have to do is cut the quirk and trim the fat. Remember the beginning of this little rant? The real Iron Man is gone. I know the counterclaim is that this vapid ramble is to give us information and express Riri's personality. But remember, this isn't a one-page story. This is an entire first issue of a presumably ongoing story. You have the room to deal out twists, information, and character. So what can we cut? Well, if we had the choice, all of it. The entire page is entirely unnecessary. Since, if this story is written correctly, we will be shown this information as the narrative progresses, rather than just just being told. And of course, we'll have plenty of time to see Riri's totally unique personality. As opposed to cramming all of this dialogue into one panel, like she ran out of internet gas and her camera froze. But, if we must have this page, let's slim it down to just the good parts, which also happens to mean upping the quality of the page turn. So rather than finishing the sentence, the reader will be, ideally, enticed through mystery or plot-related intrigue. So perhaps something like this. Hi, Riri Williams here. Okay, where do I start? First off, Tony Stark, I mean, the guy we know as Iron Man, is gone. We can trim the extra nonsense, cut it down to just the good parts, while still promoting her generic, quirky personality. Riri's connection with Tony Stark slash Iron Man is implied since she knows that he's gone, and apparently holds even more information than we're given. We just don't know to what extent setting up a bit of mystery. And leaving us off with a much larger mystery of a missing Tony Stark is a much stronger opening than, and I have no idea if I'm even close to ready, because as a reader, I don't care who Riri Williams is, 
as yet. I picked up this Iron Man comic because I do care about Tony Stark. Why should I care whether or not Riri's ready to take over as Iron Man at this stage? And, of all people, why does she need to be the one to take over? Also, Riri Williams is a current year politically fueled Little Miss fanfiction Mary Sue. Of course she's ready. And if you read through the rest of the story, Williams defeats the villain with no issue at all. Like she's playing a video game on super easy journalist mode or something. It's barely even an issue. In short, the superhero portion of the story is actually just busy work to show off how super special awesome Riri Williams is. Ultimately, what we do care about at this stage is a missing hero. This even worked to a significant degree in Soon I Will Be Invincible by Austin Grossman, where the hero Corefire goes missing. Who is Corefire? He's a nigh-invincible superhero. That's all you really know. But the idea of a powerful person, especially a hero, suddenly going missing provides contrast since a powerful person isn't easy to kill or kidnap. So it's intriguing to discover who or what could have overpowered said powerful person. And to up the ante, you can bet that whatever took down a powerful hero is going to be fairly nefarious. It's the contrast that creates the tension and intrigue, like a kind demon or an evil angel. Dexter the serial killer who only kills other killers rather than innocent people. Or a cozy mystery story where a horrible crime takes place in a location considered prestigious or otherwise crime free. Or of course the mystery of a powerful person being defeated. Mystery fueled by plot related contrast and tension is far higher quality a page turn than a simple sentence finish about a character we don't care about. And more importantly, don't tell us the information you should be about to show us. If done right, then Riri Williams being Tony Stark's apprentice in some way and eventually taking Stark's place as Iron Man should be the story. In summary, take a breath. If you have room to tell a story, use it. Let your story unfold gradually within the given amount of pages. When possible, show rather than tell. And with an opening like this, the target objective should be summarizing the story's conflict. In this case, a mysteriously missing hero. Anyway, I hope some of you found this critique helpful, and I'll be back soon with another. Speaking of comics, it is my distinct pleasure to announce that my second book, Dr. Alpha Dead Man's Lullaby, is now available on Indiegogo. Taking place 20 years before the events of Miracle Child, Dr. Alpha awakes one morning to find that he's been injected with an accelerated version of the deadly lullaby virus, a weaponized biological weapon invented by none other than Dr. Alpha's former colleague and fellow mad scientist, Dr. Mindel Cloner. Now, left without even the clothes on his back, Dr. Alpha has one hour left to live as the virus begins to degrade his ability to process adrenaline, crank style. Alpha must fight his way through hordes of cloner minions, henchmen, police, and even a few superheroes, all to find Dr. Cloner and discover the reason behind his sudden betrayal. But things stop being so simple when Alpha's vengeful rampage seems to be just a small part of a much grander scheme being played out, with the mysterious puppet master pulling the invisible strings. If Dr. Alpha Miracle Child introduced us to the character of Dr. Alpha, Dead Man's Lullaby will introduce us to the world of Dr. Alpha. We'll learn about Dr. Alpha's past, the organization known as Stratagos, the all company known as Oculux, which specializes in selling super weapons to super villains, and hints to the tragedy that led to Dr. Alpha's turn to evil, and much, much more. And rest assured, while having read Miracle Child will enhance the experience, it isn't actually necessary to follow the events of Dead Man's Lullaby. Also, while Miracle Child was met with an impressive bit of praise, no work is perfect, and was also hit with a fair bit of criticism. So I've taken those criticisms to heart, and did everything I could to improve this project. This is why Dead Man's Lullaby will be in two parts instead of just one. Miracle Child was just over 112 pages just for the main story. This isn't including the 10 pages of Lady Midnight, or the 8 pages of the New Kid side story, or the other stories included in the book. Each part of Dead Man's Lullaby will be around 70 pages long, still a meaty amount of pages. The benefit of fewer pages means the book will be completed much faster, not to mention maintain the stability of the project for both me, and more importantly, the reader. And I'm determined to send this book out out on time, or ideally, early. Which leads me to the next point. Other major critiques I received were the heavy number of panels per page, little variety in page dynamics, and too little action. This time around, my goal was 5 panels per page instead of 9. Additional care was placed into producing more dynamic page layouts. And my favorite part, I've cranked up the action to the point where my interior artist stated that this is one of the most violent comics he's worked on. And don't worry, to those who enjoy the character development and drama of 
of Miracle Child, there's a reason why this story could stretch to 140 pages or more. Dividing the story into two hefty volumes allows me to afford the cranked up action while maintaining the robust story those who have read Miracle Child may have come to expect. So, if you find the project intriguing, feel free to get yourself a copy today, and with it, passage into the Iron Age of comics.